The Night Beat starts right now. It is the largest increase in COVID-19 cases we've seen in one day since the start of this pandemic. More than 600 cases added in just the last 24 hours. And now about a third of all COVID-19 patients are in the hospital in the hospital are now in the ICU. Here in Mayor County, we now have a total of 8,452 COVID-19 cases. No new deaths to report, so the death toll remains at 104 tonight. And while more than 3,000 people have recovered from COVID-19, 5,300 are still fighting the illness. Hospital numbers are still concerning. Only 25% of staffed beds are available for Bear County. There are now 628 people in the hospital, and 202 of them are in the ICU. That's the first time those numbers have topped 200. The Bear County, one of four counties in Texas where elective surgeries are now suspended. The surge in COVID-19 cases in San Antonio having an impact in rural communities. Some ICU patients from those communities are being turned away from San Antonio hospitals that are better prepared to help them. The night team's Patty Santos tells us why doctors in rural areas are worried as the surge grows. And uh, now we have been trouble transferring patients to San Antonio because they don't have beds available for COVID patients. Eagle Pass doctor Sergio Zamora says the situation in rural communities is getting troubling. Being just a such a small hospital for the city of Eagle Pass, and we have another search, the one that we have right now, we won't have the capacity. On their website, Maverick County has 228 active cases and two deaths. Valverde County Judge Lewis Owen says they picked up 100 cases in less than a month. We had a scare a couple of days ago because we tried to get somebody shipped off to San Antonio. Rural hospitals say they are also having trouble getting medicine like remdesivir to treat COVID-19 patients. Ventilators and ICU space is limited and Eagle Pass, ICU and COVID-19 patients are on the same floor. Is it troubling? Yeah. I mean, we live out here. You know, we're almost in the middle of nowhere. San Antonio hospitals are stressed. The Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council coordinates communication for about 53 hospitals in Region 8. They say with this surge being five times worse than the first wave, rural patients may be put on a waiting list for San Antonio hospitals or rerouted. Yes, they're taking patients from rural areas where they can. Capability and capacity is always going to be a minute by minute hour by hour decision and there may be delays occasionally. Strack says San Antonio has about 20 to 25 percent of ICU beds available, but the problem is in space. We're running out of staff. So what you have is a situation where you have a bed, but you can't put anybody around it. In rural areas, the only hope is that by cracking down on mandatory face masks and social distancing guidelines, they can get the surge down in about three weeks. You need to take care of yourself. Some of the responsibility needs to lie on our citizens. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. COVID-19 is affecting hundreds of young adults in Bear County. More than 2,000 people between the ages of 20 and 29 have tested positive. The night team's Tiffany Huerta spoke with young adults about their experiences with COVID-19. I do wear a mask. I wear a mask all the time, especially when it's mandatory. When I go out, I wear a mask. These three young adults have different experiences with COVID-19. 26-year-old Tiffany Drew recently graduated from Texas A&M San Antonio. I did go out and I did like kind of just ignore the whole protocols. Tiffany now has COVID-19 and believes she got it from a family member. I didn't think I would get this at all. I thought I was young, healthy. I work out every day. And 20-year-old Riley Campbell is a student at the University of Texas at Austin and says the pandemic led her to an internship. Basically using data analysis and contact tracing and stuff to help students return to campus. 21-year-old Chandler Santos is interning at an IT company and lives in San Antonio. Me personally, I'm not going to resort to fear as a motive and I resort to my faith as what I do. Metro Health says in the age group of 20 to 29-year-olds, on April 1st, there were 38 cases. On May 1st, 286 cases. On June 1st, 550 cases. And as of yesterday, more than 2,000 cases. Your lungs are not going to be the same for a while afterward if you enjoy you know, certain kinds of exercise and, and getting out, you know, it's going to it's going to be harder. You're going to be weak for a while. It's this is not just the flu. 
As for Tiffany, she hopes her story can help others. Wait on going out. You don't want to risk it all. Tiffany Huertas, KSET 12 News. Well, the city says they are trying to reach young people in San Antonio in every way possible. They've launched a Facebook photo frame to promote staying at home, and they've even filmed a PSA with Patty Mills. The COVID-19 testing will continue at two walk-up testing sites tomorrow and Saturday. 300 free tests will be conducted at the Will Rogers Academy on McIlvain. Another 300 tests will be administered for free at the Health and Fitness Center at St. Phillips College. That's at the intersection of Hedges and Walters. Testing will take place each day from 10 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon. You saw the video Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf's hand smacked after intervening during an argument over his mask mandate. According to an incident report, Judge Wolf told investigators along with cursing at him, the man seen in this video told the judge he would, quote, get Trump on him, end quote. Trey Toller is the man accused in this case. He turned himself over to authorities the day after the incident at a local hardware store on Callahan. The felony assault charge was he was facing was reduced to a disorderly conduct charge. Toller's attorney, former Bear County District Attorney Nico LaHood, contests any wrongdoing on Toller's part. Judge Wolf approached him. Judge Wolf did not maintain six feet distance. I don't know why. You'll have to ask Judge Wolf. Judge Wolf offered him a card over his shoulder into his face that he didn't ask for. LaHood also argues the arrest warrant was issued without any due process. Judge Wolf has said he did not want to pursue any criminal complaints, so it wouldn't, quote, be a distraction of our main focus of requiring businesses to have customers wear masks and continuing to ensure the health and safety of everyone in our community, end quote. Well, she's accused of creating an offensive post online involving a noose. Now the actions of the Edgewood ISD trustee are set to be discussed at a special meeting on Monday. Trustee Dina Serrano, who's also the board vice president, is accused of posting this picture of a man with his head in a noose and two children pulling on the rope. Now a source told the case at defenders Serrano could be removed as board vice president as well as face other disciplinary action. Serrano issued an apology today saying, quote, my naivety in thinking this was an innocent fun picture was interpreted as malicious, insensitive, and racist. I get it. Being a Latina woman from the barrio, I understand how hurtful my actions were. I'm sorry, end quote. Monday's meeting is set for 1 p.m. A new on the night beat a crash on the south side, leaving a mangled mess of metal and several people injured. It happened on Ashley and Roosevelt. A small white sedan and a truck collided at the intersection before 7 this evening. Investigators say three people were seriously hurt, but it is unclear exactly who was at fault. Well, one man shot and the suspect is on the run tonight. Police are releasing new details and a possible motive in a West Side shooting we first told you about yesterday. It happened near West Poplar and Northwest 26th Street. Officers say the suspect went to a home there to address an issue involving a vehicle that was damaged last week. Well, after getting in an argument, police say the suspect told an 18 year old and his friend to meet at the corner so they could fight. Instead, police say the suspect pulled out a gun and shot the 18 year old twice before taking off. The victim was taken to the hospital and witnesses were taken in for questioning. A jury moving a criminal case forward against former Bear County Sheriff's Deputy Brandon Doji. The 27 year old indicted for tampering with evidence and official oppression. It all goes back to a case in May of last year during an assault of a jail inmate. The sheriff's office says Doji intentionally turned off the body camera worn by another deputy during that assault. Doji fired on April 27th. If convicted, he faces up to 10 years in prison and up to $14,000 in fines. That rain chance today materi materialized for some folks, of course, not everybody saw it. We're in the type of pattern where we'll get some downpours, but not in everybody's backyard and neighborhood. You see over the past five hours, the radar, especially Wilson County had some good rainfall. Lavaca County was the real winner. We'll look at the rainfall accumulations in more depth coming up in a few minutes, but even Northern Bear County, Timberwood Park, Stone Oak over to Leon Springs and Bernie got clipped by some good rain. So we're going to talk about those rainfall totals from today, and if you didn't get it today, Better chances for tomorrow. I'm going to tell you all about that and the weekend coming right up.
Thank you, Adam. Still ahead on the night beat, infectious disease doctor Ruth Berger and joining us live as we see a hike in more than 600 cases of COVID-19 in 24 hours. Our case at Q&A is coming up. And the push to end racism continues. We head to the east side where this march was held on a solemn anniversary. And a day after a police reform measure was denied, the House passing a new version. What it entails as it heads to the Senate. Next on the Night Beat. Coming up tomorrow morning on GMSA, we introduce you to our next great graduate. This one from Trinity University. She's a triple major and her master's program has been fully paid for. Tomorrow we'll tell you about how she wants to use her education to give back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. The debate on federal police reform has come to a boiling point in the nation's capital with lawmakers drawing hard lines in the sand on what they want to see changed. Nadia Romero has the latest. This is the day we pass legislation to transform policing in America. The yeas are 236, the nays are 181, the bill is passed. House Democrats George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passing through the House along hard party lines. The bill bans no knock warrants in federal drug cases, prohibits racial profiling, reforms qualified immunity for law enforcement, establishes a national database tracking police misconduct, and bans chokeholds, classifying them as a civil rights violation. The House vote comes one day after Democrats killed a competing Republican bill in the Senate. And Tim Scott's bill actually had a lot of overlap with the Democrats bill, but they wanted to eliminate qualified immunity. They wanted to eliminate no knock entries. Now the bill heads to the GOP controlled Senate where it has little chance of making it through. The Senate will have a choice to honor George Floyd's life or to do nothing. If you don't allow amendments in the House bill mm -hmm. and you won't accept amendments on the Senate bill, mm -hmm. how do we think you serious I don't take you seriously about uh, reform at the White House I'm Nadia Romero reporting no justice no peace no racist police Back here at home, the demand for change continues on the one month anniversary of George Floyd's death. Protesters could be seen along Foster Road earlier this evening. The group calls themselves the Reliable Revolutionaries gathering at Wagner High School before marching for about a mile to a nearby store. The group continues to call for an end to racism and police brutality. Floyd, who grew up in Houston, was killed in Minneapolis after an officer pressed his knee against Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes. The voices demanding change are being heard at San Antonio College. Their mascot, the Ranger, has brought up strong opinions and controversy. And now SAC President Dr. Robert Vela is asking for feedback on whether it should be changed. Dr. Vela described this debate over what the mascot represents as having a sense of urgency that's become stronger now than ever, than ever before. On July 14th, the College Council will be voting on the matter. You can also submit your feedback on SAC's website, alamo.edu slash SAC. The vote is set ahead of the college's 95th anniversary. Meanwhile, the controversial statue of Christopher Columbus located downtown was covered in red paint today. It, came, it comes the same day City Council listened to calls for action on the relocation of the statue. Some have said it represented the institution of slavery being brought to the U.S. Councilman Roberto Trevino has pushed to have the statue relocated. It's unclear when a final decision will be made, though. Police are investigating the report of vandalism. A crucial conversation on domestic violence in our community. KSAD joining San Antonio Metro Health to hold a town hall and a resource phone bank tomorrow. Our Courtney Friedman will moderate the event from 2 until 3 tomorrow afternoon discussing the issue with a group of panelists from law enforcement, health care and advocacy backgrounds. Experts will be ready to take your phone calls, answering questions about domestic violence and offering ways to get help. You can stream the town hall on KSAT.com or on the KSAT TV app on your smart TV device. 
and head to ksat.com right now to submit domestic violence questions you'd like us to ask our panelists. Let's take a live look outside, downtown actually, with live cam. Nice night, nice evening out there. 80 degrees right now. Yeah, it doesn't seem like as strong a wind maybe as yeah. we've seen in the last few days. Now the flag's blowing a little bit there. It's uh, waving just nicely, if you ask me. And the wind will pick up a bit tomorrow. I think it'll be breezy at times. We'll have better rain chances as well. And it was a little frustrating for some folks today. You could hear the thunder, maybe see the dark clouds off in the distance, some thunderstorms in the distance, but... No rain at your place. Well, tomorrow I think we'll have a little more widespread activity and the showers will be a little more numerous. Take a look at this great shot and then we're going to go on with some of these others. Now, this is nice. This is out of Seguin, okay? This is the wider view and we'll take the close up and there's some good cloud iridescence there. Looks like on the tops of one of the storms off in the distance, some good rainbow photos came in. This is from the medical center earlier and check this out. Timberwood Park over an inch from that downpour. What downpour? This one. Look on the right hand side of your screen. I captured it on our uh, city cam here. You'll see that big downpour of the rain just just gushing out of that thunderstorm and then it dissipates come sunset. You had a little bit of Virga out of that cloud and poof, it's all gone and all done. No rain at the airport, of course, today. Started the day at 72. We made it up to 95 for the high, which is just two degrees above average. Here's a look at the rainfall estimates according to Doppler radar. It was mostly east of I-35 today and especially closer to Houston. You get into Lavaca County, Hallettsville area, upwards of three inches estimated by the radar. Just south of Gonzales, same story, but there were other parts of Gonzales County with nothing or just minimal trace amounts of rainfall. Then you get just west of Nixon into Wilson County and near Floresville. We had some good estimates and really as for San Antonio and Bear County, far north side of town, that's it. Stone Oak west of 281, good rainfall over an inch. Stone Oak east of 281, psh, nothing at all. Timberwood Park, good rain. Bulverde got clipped by some good rain. Leon Springs and even Bernie. Bernie, uh, seven tenths of an inch measured rain gauges in the city of Bernie. Right now, nothing to speak of. The activity was all earlier today, and really it was confined to just along the coastal bend and creeping into our neck of the woods here throughout the day today. And here's what's happening. We don't have the big blue H directly overhead. I talked about this before. That means the doors open. The opportunity is there for some energy moisture disturbances to move in, and we're getting that. See this activity down here in Mexico and what flared up earlier today over the Gulf? We're going to tap into some of that moisture tomorrow. And I think that's going to lead to some of those real heavy tropical downpours scattered in nature. I do like this particular computer model. We're in the same line of thinking here, mainly just cloudy in the morning, maybe a shower closer to the coast. Then we get to the midday hours and we'll see some activity east of San Antonio, east of I-35. Then into the afternoon and early evening, we'll start to see our rain chances increase a bit in and around San Antonio and pretty much a, a good portion is South Texas, but lesser chances the closer you are to the Rio Grande. Notice at 6 p.m. still some downpours out there, non severe thunderstorms, just some efficient rainmakers, a lot of moisture to be wrung out of the air. Right now we're 78 in Gonzales, 79 in New Braunfels here in San Antonio and even 80 degrees and really the warm spots Del Rio at 93, quite a bit warmer than uh, the rest of our area. 75 in the morning, 84 at noon, and I think we'll top out right around 90 with the increasing rain chances for the second part of the day. I mean, we're talking afternoon through the early evening. We'll have some of those scattered tropical downpours. Not everybody's going to get them, but some folks will get that good soaking. So cross your fingers because once we get into the weekend, rain chances are looking measly. I mean, about 20% with highs in the lower 90s. The next week we turn off those rain chances and in turn we turn up the heat. We're looking at some upper 90s right Ooh. now. Steve, Aces. That's going to be fun. Just in time <laughs> for July, fun. right? Thank you, Adam. All right, speaking of July, we now know when the Spurs will head to Florida. Yeah, they'll be one of the first. They're going to be heading out there on July the 9th when we come back about more about the Spurs, what the NBA security is going to all be about. And a world champ arrives home here in San Antonio coming up. Football coverage 
Powered by Davis Law Firm. The Hall of Fame game between the Dallas Cowboys and the Pittsburgh Steelers, originally scheduled for this August the 6th, has been postponed along with the enshrinement ceremony until next year due to the coronavirus. We knew that was a possibility, but today they made it official. The Hall of Fame game, the first official NFL postponement due to COVID-19. The president and CEO of the Hall of Fame, David Baker, says they will honor the centennial class next August. The Hall of Fame game now being rescheduled, according to NFL.com, to August the 5th, 2021. Cowboys star running back Ezekiel Elliott is one of three NFL players that we know of who have tested positive for the coronavirus. The others being the Broncos' Kareem Jackson and Von Miller. Zeke admits he had several symptoms, including shortness of breath and a cough, but is on the road to recovery. We'll test again next week to make sure he is negative. But because of what he has gone through, he was asked what he thinks if, if there will be an NFL season. I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of moving parts that have to be figured out. Um, I just don't know how they can keep the, the players healthy. And it's not even so much, I would say, the players' health because, I mean, I got corona and it did, really didn't affect me much. But, you know, some a lot of people have, have kids. You know, they may have kids with asthma. They may have newborn babies. Um, their parents or grandparents may live with them. And uh, I just... Um, that we have to find a way just to make sure that the players and their families and even and the coaches also and their families um, aren't put at risk. Now, originally, the Cowboys and the Pittsburgh Steelers were set to arrive at training camp at their own facilities on July the 22nd due to the Hall of Fame game. But now that that game has been postponed until next year, it is being reported by NFL.com that the NFL and the NFL Players Association have agreed for all players to report to training camp on July 28th. Even the Texans and the Kansas City Chiefs who are scheduled to kick off the season on Thursday night football, September the 10th. Vince Carter has made it official after 22 years in the NBA. He has decided to retire. Carter, who is now 43 years of age, made the announcement on his own podcast after signing a one-year contract with the Atlanta Hawks last year, but he did not get to finish this season due to the coronavirus outbreak. Carter is 19th all-time in NBA scoring after winning Rookie of the Year in 1999, playing for eight different teams. He won the slam dunk contest in 2000. He's the first player in NBA history to play in four different decades. The NBA has shared a security plan with players to help enforce the health and safety protocols when the league reopens at Disney World in Florida at the Wide World of Sports Complex when teams start arriving on July 7th with the Spurs set to arrive on July 9th, according to The Athletic. The NBA says it will use local, state, federal law enforcement agencies, as well as contracted security professionals and team security staffs. NBA locations in Orlando will have secured perimeters, technical security deployments, and a fusion center with the help of the Department of Homeland Security, Disney World Security, and the NBA's Global Security Operations Center to monitor any social media threats. And any off-campus movement organized for leisure purposes, the NBA will also use former special operations forces personnel to provide a safety bubble. The flying chocolates hit the practice field of the wolf. Next. There will be baseball at the Wolf under the flag of the Flying Chonclues. Submissions have put together a team of college players and local ties, including guys like former Ch Bernie champion star Jordan Thompson and pitcher Jaime Ramirez of Holy Cross. They will be competing in the Texas Collegiate League starting on June the 30th in Amarillo, holding workouts today at the Wolf. I'm excited about this team and I'm excited about the players on the roster as well. Like I know so many dudes and a lot of them are from this area actually. So we're bonded together and we're, we're gelling pretty tight knit as a team. It's real awesome just to play in my home state and hometown to represent my hometown in the summer college league. It means a lot. In the middle of summer, we come to a night game here. We get to run like across the infield and everything. So it's good to actually be playing here now instead of just running the bases. So. In my home city, couldn't have been happy playing at Wolf Stadium. Growing up here, like watching Missions game, I was like, it's a dream come true, and I was so excited for the opportunity to play here. All right, the first home game will be Friday, July the 3rd against Arcadiana for tickets, and there will be fans in the stands. Just go to samissions.com. Look who's bringing home the hardware. That's Joshua Franco arriving at San Antonio's International Airport this afternoon as a WBA Super Flyweight World Champion. That's after he beat Andrew Maloney with a unanimous decision in Las Vegas on Tuesday night to become San Antonio's fifth World Boxing Champion. It was the best shape I ever been in. I knew going into the fight that I was gonna dominate. No, no matter what that guy was gonna was gonna do, you know, I knew that I had to get the belt. Did, did was there a sense of relief with the knockdown in the 11th that you felt like you're in the right path of, of taking the victory at that point? Yeah, I I, I thought after uh, I knocked him down, he got back up that I was gonna be able to finish him. 
but you know, he, he was the champ for a reason. He knew how to survive and that's what he did. But you know, either way I knew I was dominating, you know, past, past the sixth round. All right, that was our Andrew Seeley at the airport and our Larry Ramirez will sit down with Joshua and have that for you on instant replay this Sunday night. Awesome. Congratulations to him. And Indeed. Yeah, welcome. Big home. win. Thank you, up, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Up next, a live discussion and your questions for infectious disease doctor Ruth Bergeron, our KSAT Q&A after the break. It's a segment of the show we call KSAT Q&A, and we take your questions and our questions to local experts about some of the major topics that are happening in the news right now. And certainly COVID-19 continues to be a major topic, and we are glad to be joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease doctor. Thank you for staying up late with us, doctor. And the first question is your reaction to the fact that we set a 24 hour record basically for the number of people tested positive for COVID-19, 638. We've got to take action. So here's my reaction, cover for COVID. What do I mean? Put your mask on. This is my Spurs mask. Okay, we need teamwork here. San Antonio, you're good at being a team. Let's go for it. We've got to cover our faces or we're not going to kick COVID out of this city. We've got to social distance. We've got to test smart and we'll come back to that about who, what, where, when, how we should test. We need to answer the phone when the contact tracers call us. That's people who are calling from a 210 area code and then the prefix is 270. If you see 210, 270, that's probably a contact tracer from Metro Health calling you to let you know about an exposure. If we don't answer the phone, we can't do the contact tracing. We really need to do it. And finally, you gotta stay out. What do you have to stay out of? You need to stay out of crowded places, bars, gyms, large indoor gatherings, anywhere where there's groups of people, especially if they're inside without masks on. And finally, stay out of the emergency room. That is the place you do not wanna go and get your COVID test from because they are filling up with people that have symptoms. It's a place where you might get exposed. So if you need a test, you need to call 311, go to the city of San Antonio's website and find out where to get tested. Speaking of those tests, I, I wanna ask you about that because so many people are in search of one right now. If you think you've been exposed, when is the best time to get that test? Should you wait a certain number of days or should you wait for symptoms or do you go as soon as you find out that you've been exposed? Clarify that for us. Yeah, viewer Selena actually asked that very question about her granddaughter. So Selena, that's a good timing on that question and there's been some recent new information that helps us answer that question much with much better data, much better science than we were able to answer it even a few weeks ago. And the first and foremost is if you develop symptoms after an exposure, go get tested, okay? On average, on average, that happens about five days. If you're gonna get symptomatic, most people will get symptomatic around five days after exposure, but it could be up to 14 days. So get tested if you have symptoms or if you just haven't gotten any symptoms and you've had a known exposure, eight days. And why do I say eight days? We have now got some data that shows us if you get tested just one day after you were exposed, there is a 100% chance that your test will be negative and we'll wow. call it a false wow. negative because maybe you were somebody who was gonna be infected, but you cannot figure that out on day one. By about day four after your exposure, that risk of a false negative drops a little bit, but not very much. There's still a chance, a 67% chance that you would have a false negative test on day four. So it turns out that you have to wait until day eight after your exposure to have the best chance of actually getting a positive test that's a true positive. At day eight, your false negative rate is about 20%, and then after that, it starts to go back up again. So we tell people, if you've had an exposure and you have no symptoms, you wait till you get symptoms or you wait until the eighth day, whichever comes first, and that's when you go get tested. All right, another viewer, Douglas, uh, asks, how does COVID affect an individual's health? 
Well, COVID can affect your health in many, many ways in the short term and the long term. In the short term, you've all heard the symptoms and not everybody is going to get sick enough to go to the hospital, but those that do are experiencing real shortness of breath. It's a feeling of air hunger and people actually kind of turn blue when they're going to sleep and they may not realize right away that they they are lacking air, that they're hypoxic, we say, low oxygen, um, but, but those people really need to go to the emergency room. Those are the ones we want to see in the emergency room if, if you're turning blue, if you're having air hunger. Um, affects uh, coughing. It can affect your sense of smell and your sense of taste. They can go away. That can be an early sign. You can have gastrointestinal symptoms. You can have nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Um, now, the more severe cases, though, progress all the way to respiratory failure, meaning that you can no longer keep up with your body's oxygen requirements, even when you're breathing hard and fast and on a lot of oxygen. And those folks need to get a tube put down into their lungs. They usually have to be sedated, more or less put into a coma for a while with medications so the machines can breathe for them. We often have to turn people on their stomachs. Um, before or during their intubation to improve the aeration of their lungs. And then there's a whole slew of side effects or additional effects uh, of the virus on your blood vessels. We see blood clots. uh, We see abnormal heart rhythms. um, We see people having cardiac arrests. So, and, and there can be neurologic side effects. So people who get the really severe form of the disease are coping with multi-system organ problems, and some of them can be pretty long-lasting. You know, if they're fortunate to recover and get off that ventilator, um, they can still have a very long recovery period. Dr. Ruth, for so long, San Antonio had been watching the rest of the world go through this, and now it is here, now it is on our doorstep in, in, in a very real sense. Is there any way to predict if this, for, for us here locally, if this is going to be a wave or if this is going to be a tsunami? What do models say? Right, so there are several models that we've been looking at at UT Health Science Center and that UT, our colleagues at UTSA also have a model and um, they're not pretty right now. Um, They they show that we are on a definite uptick. Um, One of the models shows us peaking in around um, mid to late August. Um, another model shows us just going, you know, straight up and up and up. And it depends uh, on a lot of factors. What the models show depend on what you, what assumptions you make. And here's some positive news. If we make changes, in other words, if we start masking and social distancing and following the instructions of the contact tracing um, and staying out of indoor gatherings, if we do that, we can flatten our curve back down. Now, I believe that the current surge will see us come flatten back down or come come back off that high high slope, but we could be then at risk for another surge in the fall, especially if we further relax restrictions, um, have people going to school, don't have a vaccine yet, and in that flu season, we would also expect a resurgence of COVID. So let's hope for flattening the curve and bringing down this incredible uptick that we're seeing, it's, it's really, it's exponential growth. I mean, we are seeing increases of 10% per day, every single day in the hospital. If we keep going like this with no flattening, we could exceed the available bed capacity in as early as two weeks. Now, I'm very hopeful that we will start to see a bend in the curve. I believe that people will get it. I know San Antonio can put the mask on, um, but this is a critical time for people to come together and take this very seriously. Dr. Ruth Berger and UT Health San Antonio, appreciate you answering our questions and our viewers' questions. Hope to see you next Thursday. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. We'll be right back. And making headlines around Texas tonight, a deadly crash after a driver refuses to stop for Border Patrol agents. Seven people in that vehicle died in El Paso this morning. Three others have life-threatening injuries. The car crashed in the downtown area as border agents tried to pull it over. The crash site posed risks for crews trying to remove the car because it hit near a high-voltage line. 
The El Paso Police Department is leading the investigation into the crash. The biggest children's hospital in the state opening its doors to adults as coronavirus hospitalizations go up. Texas Children's Hospital in Houston changing its policy to help create some additional space as other hospitals prepare to activate surge plans that will allow them to expand ICU beds above maximum capacities. COVID-19 hospitalizations in Texas more than doubled in the last month. They nearly tripled in the area in the same per time period. At this rate, officials say Texas Medical Center Group hospitals will run out of regular ICU beds in two weeks. Normal ICU capacity at TMC hospitals is 14,062. In emergencies, the hospitals can double that. We've been talking about the coronavirus continuing to surge in the U.S. and in San Antonio. In the United States, though, the cases are up in over half of the country. Hospitalizations on the rise in 23 states, including Texas, where 18 people were infected after a surprise birthday party. One of the family members now struggling for his life. All of this while the debate over wearing masks rages on and the presidential campaign hit, heats up. ABC's Zareen Shaw has a story. One of the country's biggest states now slamming on the brakes. Texas governor saying they're not moving ahead with their next reopening phase. This coming as they faced a staggering 4,300 hospitalizations on Wednesday. One of those patients diagnosed while pregnant with this message to her doctor who helped her with plasma treatment. You saved my life and my baby's life. While some fight for their lives, others battling wearing masks. They're now mandatory in Palm Beach County, Florida. The fact of the matter is, it's our bodies, it's our choice whether we're going to wear them, not wear them. You guys are overstepping your boundaries 100%. One Scottsdale council member appearing to mock George Floyd and Eric Gardner's final words during an anti-mask protest in Arizona. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Apologizing after receiving backlash. But a new ABC Ipsos poll shows 89% of Americans who left their home in the past week say they've worn a face covering, up over 40% from early April. One person who hasn't been seen in one, though, the president. And he avoided taking any responsibility for surging cases Thursday at his Wisconsin event. We've done an incredible historic job. His opponent, Joe Biden, saying Trump is not facing the problem. We're going to be dealing with for this for a long time. Trump can't wish it away. He can't bend it to meet his political wishes. There are no miracles coming. What experts say is coming are more infections. The CDC now warning for every coronavirus case they have confirmed, another 10 people are likely infected. Zoreen Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. With COVID-19 infection rates and hospitalizations increasing at an alarming rate, health experts say practicing social distancing and wearing a mask is more important than ever. As part of the new KSAC community campaign in partnership with University Hospital, we want to know why you wear a mask. Alicia Barrera shows you how you can participate. It's become the new accessory, whether it's a bandana, a face covering with a little personality, or a medical grade face mask. One thing that we are finding out is that there are so many different factors going on in the world right now. But what we do know is that with using the proper technique of wearing your mask, it can reduce the transmission of COVID-19. COVID-19 cases are spiking in San Antonio and University Health System is using social media to encourage the community to continue wearing face masks. You want to take care of everybody. And I think that's kind of the big thing about this initiative. It's that it's not just me, it's not just you, it's all of us together. Do you wear a face mask? Well, we want to hear more about your motivation. Just on a personal note, you just never know what's going on in the world. Uh, for me, myself, I, you never know if you're asymptomatic. Here's how you can share in four simple steps. First, snap a selfie. Next, tell us why you wear it. Step three, use the hashtag why I wear a mask essay in your caption. And last step, Click the hashtag to engage with the community and learn why others are choosing to wear their masks. Like Christina Olivares, who shared that she wears a mask to protect not only herself, but also her community. Or like this woman, who shared on our KSAT page that she wears a mask during her work shift at a local call center. I have a growing collection of masks and here's why I choose to wear them. To keep my family safe, but also to keep my co-workers at KSAT safe so we can continue to inform our community. Reporting from home, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. And speaking of masks. 
I got a really cool one yesterday. From yeah. My friend Adam Kasky. Yeah, I know. He's got a yes. designer mask. Hooked us up. But he's, yeah. he's showing one off right now. Weather watcher Brian Alston of the Total Source hooked us up and surprised us with some of these. Uh, I'm smiling right now. That's what I hate about the masks. <laughs> the one thing I hate is that you can't tell when people are smiling. Sometimes you can see it in their eyes, but it's those little pleasantries or subtleties when you're walking down an aisle. It's hard to communicate it with. Anyway, we do wear them around here at KSAT, too, just to be safe and be careful. All right. Let's talk about the dust, the African dust that's in the air. I saw a picture on social media from South Padre Island, the national seashore there, and they definitely, you can see a bit of dust in the, in the sky, an extra haze down there. Here, I noticed a little bit of it in the sky, but not a whole lot, to be honest with you. Going forward with the dust, it definitely will be more dense the next few days. Doesn't mean you'll visually and it'll be, you'll visually notice it and it'll be very visible, but I do think it's gonna lead to some of the dusty, muddy downpours as well. Then we get it to Saturday with a clearer sky. I think you'll notice an extra haze on Saturday and Sunday start to disperse a little bit. I'm gonna play this animation for you again one more time. And notice how even into next week, we could see another boost in the dust concentrations here, but this is what's interesting. Look how far north this dust is likely to spread. I mean, by Saturday, we're talking St. Louis and even parts of Kansas as well. And oh, it could even stretch all the way up into Canada. They could have some basically lighter volumes of the dust up in the air in Canada by early next week. So this dust does reach pretty far. It's something we see every year. And if you have a sensitive respiratory system, it may affect you as we go through the next couple of days. Now tomorrow, rain chances are looking a little bit better, meaning some more widespread showers and thunderstorms, non-severe in nature. In the morning, mainly southeast of town. Then we work our way into the afternoon and we're likely to see more numerous downpours developing. In between those downpours, a little bit of sunshine here and there. And by the way, the farther west you are of San Antonio, the lesser your chance of rain is. It's unlikely we'll see much rain really make it over toward the Rio Grande. But notice into the evening hours, that rain comes to an end when we lose our daytime heating. We'll have a lot of moisture in the air, so I think we'll have some very efficient downpours tomorrow. 77 in Bulverde, 79 in Canyon Lake, Comfort Year 75, and right now Divine at 78 degrees. Still 90 out west, right along the border there. 90 degrees in Del Rio, that's one of the more, still warmer locations, even at this hour. Very humid out there, and it's going to be very sticky tomorrow. That's going to lead to some of those downpours. I think we'll stay in the upper 80s to right around 90 for the high temperature. And then into the weekend, lesser chances, only about 20%. The next week, rain chances really fall off as the temperature rises into the upper 90s. Hello, July. Yes, indeed. Thank yeah. you so much, Adam. We'll be right back. If you've updated your cell phone recently, you may have noticed something new. It's called COVID-19 exposure notifications. Apple and Google are rolling it out as a way to help track the virus. And it's raising questions like, are they tracking me? As 12 on your side's Marilyn Mortz explains, it's a potential way to help connect the dots. It's right there in your phone settings. COVID-19 exposure notifications. It's causing a social media buzz with comments like, this is scary. The iOS downloaded this piece, so your phone now has it. But Mary Dickerson, Chief Information Security Officer for the University of Houston, says it's not that scary or invasive. It allows that phone, if there is an app that can use that particular piece of software, it will allow for this tracking to occur. What's on on your phone is not an app. It's technology that would allow an app if one is created for public health departments and if you download it to track people who've been exposed to the virus. In theory, here's how it would work. If you and I are both at Starbucks and I have it enabled on my phone and you have it enabled on your phone, our phones will exchange the random ID number. So I will get a listing of your ID number in my phone because I have been in proximity with you. Then if either user tests positive for COVID-19, they could then go back into the app and share the information with the users they were in contact with. So far, only three states have said they want to create such an app. And if one were eventually to be created for Texas, you would have to download it yourself and opt in. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News.
Well, for 10 weeks, Margaret Payne has been climbing the stairs of her Scottish home, not just to get around, but so she could scale the equivalent of 2,398 feet. That is the height of Scotland's iconic Sylvan Mountain. Payne took on the challenge after being inspired by Sir Tom Moore, who finished 100 laps in his garden before his 100th birthday to raise $40 million for Britain's National Health Service. Payne ended up raising over half a million million dollars herself. Well, tourists and Parisians will once again get to scale the Eiffel Tower after being shuttered for three months because of the pandemic. The tower reopening today in Paris. It's the landmark's longest closure since World War II. Visitors will need a ticket. They'll have to take the stairs. The elevator won't be open until July 1st. Nearby workers at the Louvre Museum are also putting final touches on preparations for a July 6th opening at the Louvre. All right, tomorrow we'll start the day in the 70s, then we'll make it all the way up to near 90 for the high temperature. And we are expecting those rain chances to really increase into the afternoon and early evening. Now that said, not everybody's going to get it, but I think the coverage will be better tomorrow compared to the isolated downpour we had today. Then we get into the weekend, rain chances fall off. Thank, Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Adam. GMSA at 430 in the morning. Good night.